the reality shows are somewhat it's, insidious because yeah. you know people come morning. in and I keep saying you don't think other people could have had that same hi I mean, it's good morning I'm gonna start our next uh, session my name is Steve Crone I'm a, a uh, the director of the Biederman Institute and a professor at Southwestern Law School, also counsel at Mitchell, Silberberg, and Knopp. I'm going to quickly introduce our panelists. There are full bios in your materials, which you can reference, but I at least want to introduce them to you real quickly. Starting on my immediate left, Glenn Kulik is founding partner of the law firm of Kulik, Gottesman, and Siegel. To his left, Tara Cole. She is a partner at the firm of Gang Tire, Raymer, and Brown. Next to Tara, Heather Pearson, senior counsel at the Writers Guild. And finally, on my far left, Jody Zucker, general counsel of Warner Brothers Television. And with that, we're going to get right into our subject. And I'll sit down for that. Um, we're talking today about protecting your ideas and perhaps even more substantial submissions uh, to buyers like producers, studios, what have you. I'm just going to give a 90 second introduction to kind of frame the issue and then we're going to kind of take you through the process chronologically from what do you do before you even show your idea to anyone else and then straight through setting up a meeting, having that meeting, following up all the way through to a possible dispute that might arise if, if, if you believe someone has used your idea uh, inappropriately without your permission. So just to quickly frame the issue from a legal perspective, although certainly a lot of what we'll give you is practical advice. I, copyright law protects, in the film context, certain kinds of things, well-developed screenplays, etc. But it doesn't protect ideas. Idea submission claims are typically necessary when one of two things is true. Either whatever it is that you've created doesn't rise to the level of being copyrightable. A mere idea, for instance, wouldn't generally be copyrightable. The other context in which it arises is, even though your work is copyrightable, let's say it's a 12-page treatment or a 118-page screenplay, and it is copyrightable, the use that's made of it by the other party may not rise to the level of being copyright infringement. We won't get into the technicalities, but using just a little bit of your screenplay, maybe just its basic idea, that might not be copyright infringement. So those are the two contexts in which idea submission claims typically arise. Having said that, um, we're going to just kind of have a freewheeling discussion. If at any point you have questions, please feel free to raise your hands. We may or may not see you in light of that gigantic light that is in our face, but we'll try our best. Um, we're going to start chronologically, and I'll just throw it out to the group before you even go out into the world with your idea. It's just you sitting at your laptop or with your yellow legal pad, Jody. Um, what, what, what do you need to do to maximize your ability to protect your idea uh, right out of the gate? And we don't have any particular order here, so it's going to be a very free-flowing discussion. Hey, write it down. Um, honestly, I, I, I actually have to even take some exception with the whole notion that it's your idea. Um, the fact is, is, as Steve has just explained, copyright doesn't protect ideas. There's no property interest in the idea. And before that, that makes you uh, have any great concern, that works to protect you too, because it's not your idea. It's probably been done before, and that protects you from a claim that you are stealing someone else's material. That's what copyright is for. So uh, I have to say that you know my best advice, just even as a studio guy, is write it down. Uh, then you have something that's tangible, something that is potentially protected by copyright, and something that you can uh, uh, per assert a right to. And, and, and by the way, write down the details. I mean, don't just say, I had an idea about a buddy cop movie. Uh, I'll email it to myself, and that will be good enough. It's not going to work. I mean, what you need to do is really say, 
um, okay, you know, what happens in Act Two that's unique, or if it's a, you know, a television show, what does the season arc look like? Who are the characters? What are their names? What do they do for a living? Just the more detail that you can give. Um, and it's really just to yourself, or, or maybe you want to, you know, some people I know actually put things into an envelope and mail them to themselves so that they have, and they don't, never open it again, so that they have it dated. I think that's probably more than you need to do. But the more that you can flesh out the idea before you walk in with it to somebody, the better off you are. When, <clears throat> when writers come to me and ask me uh, what they can do before they submit something to, uh, to a production company or a studio, there's three or four things that I usually tell them. Obviously, first, write it down. Uh, the second thing I tell them is to create some sort of proof of when they created their idea. Um, as was just said, you know, people sometimes say you mail an envelope to yourself and you don't open it. A more conventional way these days to do it is, is to register it with the Writers Guild of America. Um, you don't have to be a Writers Guild member in order to do that. There's a nominal fee. Uh, it lasts, right, lasts for a few years. I, I think that's probably the easiest and safest way to do it. And then I always tell people that once they've written it down, write the word confidential. Uh, on every page. There's a claim in California called breach of confidence and having the word confidential on the pages, even if you don't speak those words to the people to whom you're pitching or submitting, just having it on the page. If you have a cover letter you use, put slip the word confidential in there somewhere. I think that generally helps as well. I'm going to be looking for that now. <laughs> the next one I see that has it, I'm going to know has been talking to Glenn. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> dear Jody, thank you for agreeing to, to read my confidential submission of so-and-so. Something subtle like that. I would add that you, you can um, save drafts. I mean, that idea might change. So keeping all the drafts that you have in whatever type of an or disorganized file that most of the writers I talk to have. But you know, the ideas change, so keeping drafts because you'll say, oh, this isn't what I pitched, but that was my idea three drafts back. And um, so keeping the drafts and either writing confidential or writing copyright, whether it is or not, it, if anybody sees it, it is you know, indicating that you are intending to copyright and to protect that work. So Great. in registering, like he said, it's really easy on the Guild's website. You can go into the office and do it, but there's no need to. So, so the, maybe the one thing that I'll add before we move on to sort of setting up that meeting or, or mailing in the submission, sometimes writers are going in to give a, to give a take. In other words, it's not their original idea. It's existing material that the production company, studio, television network, whatever, owns, and they're asking a writer to come in and make a take. Typically, but not always, um, written materials aren't expected in that context. Um, typically, development executives wouldn't expect you to submit your take in writing. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't write it down. Right? If you have a take that you're gonna go in for the next Spider-Man movie, there's no reason why you can't write down what it is you're going to pitch orally. So even if you're not going to actually submit what you write, that doesn't mean you shouldn't write down what you plan to say. And after the meeting, write down what you actually did say. Maybe a few of the things in your, in your preparation didn't get said in the meeting. Maybe some things that weren't in the writing got said. So keep a documentary record of what you submit even if you submit it just by saying it. You still create a record of what you, at least your record of what you think you said. That doesn't mean that, 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 that everyone's gonna agree with that if a dispute arises, but at least you've got contemporaneous evidence of what you think you said. Can I add to that? You yeah. said that you wouldn't necessarily hand over your written work, and if you were a member of the Guild or you were working for a signatory company, or, um, which most of the, many studios are, you would, um, you can't leave a written copy. That would be writing for free, and it's against the working rules of the union. And professional writers shouldn't and don't do it, um, and it shouldn't be expected. So, um, that that is something Good to point. think about, and it keeps you. Um, it, it helps you not be handing over your work if you say, "I don't think I'm expected to." You can. Great. Figure out how that goes. So real quickly, because I think this is a quick step, you're either then going to try and set up a meeting with someone or you're going to send a submission by email or um, by conventional mail. Glenn has already alluded to uh, 
what you say in your letter, confidential, other words to this effect. I suspect an expectation that you expect to be compensated if the idea is used. So any other ideas about what needs to be said when you're submitting or setting up the meeting to pitch your, your ideas? I think it's really important to know that chances of your submission being read by being sent in that manner at a studio, certainly like Warner Brothers or any of the major studios, pretty negligible. Uh, every studio has a policy. It's, it's unfortunate, but I think it's obvious why it's necessary. There's a, a, a massive amount of submissions even with these policies. Uh, we don't read unsolicited submissions, ones that are just sent in, even if you know somebody, and probably you do. Um, the the uh, policy of Warner Brothers, certainly in the TV division and the feature division treats it similarly, is we really want the submission to come through an agent. Uh, it, it actually acts a little bit as a clearinghouse for us. Um, if an agent has decided this work is worth representing, then we know it's cleared a step. Um, but it also uh, it sets up the right kind of expectation, and those are the meetings that we take. Uh, we don't really take meetings and read unsolicited submissions, uh, regardless of who they come from. Well, we were having a discussion before the, the panel started today. Uh, you, you can sort of perhaps see some of the biases and predilections of those of us who are sitting up here right now. But I, I, I find that, yes, of course, uh, any network or studio will tell you that they're not going to look at anything or read anything if it doesn't come through an agent. Yet in the real world, perhaps not at Warner Brothers, but elsewhere, uh, I find that people do uh, oftentimes have a way of getting their material into somebody to read and see. And um, I, I don't recommend just randomly sending, getting somebody's name and just sending something unsolicited like that. But if somebody indicates to you that they'll take a look at something that you have, you do need to have a cover letter so you have a written record uh, of what was sent and the date it was sent. I do think you should send something, you know, use the word confidential in there some way. Um, but I don't think you want to be too heavy handed in your letter because you're going to scare people if, if you do. So you don't want to say, you know, of course, if you use this, I expect to be compensated. I, I, I think everybody sort of understands that. And I think by doing something like that, you're, you're diminishing the odds of somebody actually looking at it. So you do want a cover letter. You do want that cover letter to be dated. And, and that's important because you'd be surprised at how many cover letters I see that are not dated. It should be dated. Um, you should keep a record uh, of all the places you submitted your material, whether you got it back, if you got some sort of response. But I, I wouldn't recommend necessarily putting anything else in particular in the letter. Great. Any other points? Okay, so one final thing I would say, we don't want to bog you down with a bunch of legal principles, but in order to maintain a successful idea submission claim in California, you do need to be submitting the idea, whether or not you say it in a letter, to a buyer, a producer, with an expectation of being compensated. So for instance, if you give a script to an actor because you really, really want them to uh, attach themselves to the project, but they are not a producer, they are not a buyer, um, that, that probably is going to fall outside of the context in which you would ever be able to bring a suit against them. So it's a certain kind of relationship where a seller is submitting something to a buyer with an expectation of being compensated if the idea is used. Um, that's a bit of an oversimplification, but again, we don't want to bog you down with legal details. So maybe this is a good time to maybe talk about submission agreements for a minute. Um, Jody raised that. I mean, in the, in the, in the, in the gap between what, what Jody and Glenn just said, I think, is this idea that well, sometimes even though your submission is unsolicited in the, in the sense that you're not represented by an agent who set up the meeting for you, you've just sort of managed to get yourself to somebody who's willing to read your material, you're probably going to face uh, a submission agreement. So maybe we'll put it up. I'm not sure we're going to parse through everything that's in it, but maybe we can talk a little bit about what you're likely to see and what your options are. The short answer is probably none, uh, but maybe we'll talk about it a little. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I drafted it, so I guess I got to take the first crack at it. <laughs> yes, this it's, is this is the Warner Brothers Television it, submission it, agreement. Yeah, and, and you know, look, well, let's be honest. It's not drafted to so much protect you as it is to protect us. Um, and and I, I think that it's probably not unlike uh, the agreement you were asked to sign here. 
Um, and it's really designed to make sure that you understand uh, that you know we don't we don't pay for ideas. Uh, we pay for the expression of those ideas. And, and it's very common in these agreements that uh, unless what you've presented is protected by copyright, um, we're not undertaking any obligation to pay you for it. Now, keep in mind, um, the studio is not in the business of stealing ideas. Uh, that's not how you become a successful studio where people want to work. The fact is, is that on the other side of these claims is another writer. Inevitably, there's a writer who wrote the project that you think embodies the idea that was stolen. And, and the, the reality is, it's you know one person on one side of this room and it's another person on the other side of the room. The studio just happens to be you know, the big face with the big pocketbook um, and, and isn't necessarily always involved in uh, how these ideas are shared among writers. So you know, to a certain extent, it's just a defensive maneuver. Um, but to another extent, it's designed to ensure that even if you're not represented, you will have the opportunity to come in and pitch your script. Uh, it's impossible probably in the end to completely protect yourself against the theft of idea. Uh, at some point, there's just an element of trust involved. And I know that's dangerously close to saying, trust me. <laughs> uh, I, 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 and I don't want to get any closer than that, but I, I think I that, think you just said trust yeah. me. We can snip it out of the tape. We've now got you saying those words. Well, you know, the, the reality is, and I think I feel fortunate that I work at a place like Warner Brothers that I think has a, a pretty well-deserved reputation. Doesn't mean we've never done anything wrong. and We don't have people there who do things wrong, but, but we're not in the business of, of stealing ideas. And if you're dealing with a company that you have a serious concern about, you know, you, maybe you shouldn't be dealing with them. Uh, there are smaller companies that might be a little more uh, unscrupulous. Yeah, that, um, that's what I was just going to say is, look, I, I, I represent talent, I represent writers and directors and actors and, um, and some producers, and I, I, I mostly do trust you. Um, mostly. <laughs> but, um, she, but you but mean I, Warner Brothers. But I, yes, but I, I, but, I, but I do, but I think a lot of what I see um, that makes me really nervous is when an actor comes to me and says, I'm meeting with such and such guy, he's a producer, I look him up, he's got you know, a couple of credits here and there, co-producing something that went you know, to video once, and you know, this guy wants me to sign an agreement. And those are the agreements, I mean, those are the, the people in general who I'm you know, less certain of, some of them are, I'm sure, very honorable, and some of them are less so. And those are the agreements that you want to look at really carefully, because I feel like those are the places where they're going to bury in some clause, which, I mean, I don't want to, you know, not to be grossly overzealous here, but th that says, I own everything you give me. Um, now, they probably won't do quite that, but they may do something like it, and it can be couched in terms that, you know, when you read them, you're like, mm, I don't know, that sounds like boilerplate, or that sounds kind of standard, and th th those, are the, those are the agreements that make me very nervous. Those are the people who generally don't ask for submission agreements, so if they're asking you for a submission agreement, that sort of uh, would send up a signal to me. Different when it's Warner Brothers, they're gonna expect that. But if it's you know somebody you meet and they say, I wanna produce something, um, and they hand you something, that would make me uncomfortable. Those are the people. I mean, we have claims, we have file cabinets of claims against lots of producers. We have plenty with Warner Brothers, but not, it's not the same. It's, um, you know, we figure, we figure out our <laughs> issues. Um, you know, there's lot, there are lots of producers that are asking you to, if, I mean, who knows how well it's drafted, but they're asking you to sign something like that where you should, should be careful. Um, another thing you can do is after you discuss an idea with the producer, you can um, write down your notes from that and register that as well or put it in an envelope so you have a record of that conversation if they're trying to maneuver the idea, but it doesn't go to this agreement. I, I think one thing that's important for all of you to remember is that the four of us, the five of us, uh, we're lawyers and or corporate executives, and we don't make our living um, creating material and trying to get it produced and, and trying to produce it ourselves sometimes. So we, we can... Uh, we can afford to have a somewhat different attitude than the people in this room. Uh, I, I, as you probably guessed, I, mean, I primarily represent plaintiffs in idea theft litigation. And I can tell you that for the past 50 years, the California Supreme Court and the California Court of Appeal, in dozens and dozens of cases, have found, you know, right or wrong, they have found uh, that people have stolen ideas. And most people I know who work in the entertainment industry 
absolutely swear that people steal ideas all the time. I, even though that's my living doing that sort of thing, I'm more jaundiced than that. I, I don't believe it's quite as prevalent as most people who work in the entertainment industry feel that it is. But it does happen. It, it does happen, and lo and behold, it even happens at wonderful places, including Warner Brothers, uh, which is a very large place, and they don't control everybody who works there, and all kinds of things that happen. And as you all know, credit is the lifeblood of, of everything that writers and producers and directors and talent do. And uh, you know, when you get one successful credit, depending on what it is and how successful a project it is, it can fuel an entire career. So there is a lot of pressure to come up with a winning idea and a winning script. Um, and uh, I know Jody, studios are, are, are often, they say things like, you know, we don't care about ideas, we don't pay for ideas, we only pay for the expression of the ideas. But the reality is, the idea has to come first. Without the idea, there's nothing to express, there's nothing to write. So um, the protection of ideas in California is recognized. There are times when people, it doesn't have to be intentional, by the way, it can be unintentional. Um, people do hear a lot of pitches and they hear things and they sometimes forget where they heard it from. So I don't mean to suggest that when these things happen that it's always malicious and intentional. It doesn't have to be in order to, uh, in order to be wrong. So you need, to, you need to be wary all the time of what you're doing with your ideas and your treatments and your, and your scripts. There's only so much you can do to protect yourself, but you need to be as smart as you can in doing so. I had, the, I had the experience of working at Paramount for a while, which had an unsolicited submission program, believe it or not, I don't know if you're aware of this, for Star Trek. Um, I was the lawyer for Star Trek for three years, which really is like the, one of the epitomes of my career. I, it's an easy show to work on. Everything takes place 400 years in the future. There's nobody, nobody uh, that's going to be defamed in that. Um, but they had an unsolicited submission policy where they actually agreed to read uh, scripts that were submitted by non-professional writers as defined by the WGA. And, I, and I, I, uh, it was the pain of my existence because it was very difficult to administer. Um, but the fact is that several of the writers who ended up writing for Star Trek and have gone on to have really great careers came through the program. So there was some value in it. But the reality is, and I asked them, why are you doing this? And they said, well, you know, after four series and 12 movies and you know thousands of episodes is only so many spatial anomalies you can fly into um, and the, you know the reality was there was um, a lot of overlap and people did read these scripts and things got planted in their head um, and, and and that's absolutely true there there has been some theft that's gone on that was innocent in intent but was in fact an idea that it got planted in a writer's head I mean, you, I, I'm not a writer, but I'm, I'm married to a writer. I've got writers in my family, and they're all drawing on their experiences in life. I, I don't know what else you write about. But I, to go back to something, one thing I've noticed writers doing a lot, being involved with them in my family, is you love to share your stuff with other writers. Um, there's the problem, and there's my worst case scenario, is that pitch didn't come to me. It came to a writer who's now a development executive with a, a production entity that works at Warner Brothers. Those are the cases I have to worry about. They didn't sign a submission agreement. They just read their friend's script. And you want to know what? Like I said, there's always a writer on the other side of these claims, and they're not all that scrupulous. I, they're not. I mean, the fact is, is that at some point, it is a writer taking this material. There's really very little evidence to suggest that a studio has ever said, I heard this pitch. How about you write it instead? Although I'm sure that's happened too, and I'm sure it's happened everywhere. Uh, but the fact is, is that there are other writers involved. And I would suggest, since they are not buyers, that you really be scrupulous about who you ask to read your stuff. If it's a showrunner that you're trying to get a job with, I get it. That's a risk you're gonna have to take. But that may become that showrunner's next project. Yeah. And that's a danger. Yeah, and there's material that is more amenable of, to idea theft than other kinds of material. You know, there's, there's high concept material where it really feels like an original idea, as, as hard as that is to come up with. And then there's stuff, you know, that's hey, it's a romantic comedy, and there isn't some super high concept, and so it would be kind of hard to steal the idea. It's all in 
the execution. It's all in the details. It's all in the structure of the script. So obviously, depending on what your idea is or what the idea upon which your screenplay or teleplay or whatever is based is, it could be something that's something you'd be more careful about keeping close to the vest or, or less careful just because it's, it's harder to steal as an idea. But by the way, don't post your written material on the internet. I, 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 I see a lot of people do that, and, and you know that's just sort of giving it away for nothing to anybody who cares to read. And even if somebody reads it there and steals it, you're not going to be able to do anything. So you do, you do. We, I think we would all agree that you do have to be really careful. I'm not saying don't share it with anybody, but you have to be very careful not to share either your ideas or your written work with, with too many people, you need to try to keep it as confidential and, and private as you can while you're trying to market it or you're thinking of marketing it. Yeah, so just very simply to, again, backfill the sort of legal ideas just so you have them in your head. Just like you have to submit that stuff to someone who's a buyer, a producer in the language of the, of the law, of, 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 of the cases, you also can't give it to someone unsolicited, right? If, if you throw it through Jerry Bruckheimer's car window as he drives uh, uh, past, past you and he decides to read it, uh, that's going to be your tough luck. And ditto with posting it on the internet. Well, now you've simply thrown it out there for the world to look at. That's different than handing it to someone in a meeting where there's a certain implicit understanding about what's going on. That implicit understanding doesn't exist when you post it on the internet or you know, stuff it in someone's mailbox at two o'clock in the morning. So those would not be strategies that any of us would suggest. I, I think we can quickly deal with, oh sorry, question, yes. Yeah. I was just wondering in regards to that, what about putting your original sizzle reel on the internet? Do you recommend that or not? I'll take a, does anyone want to take a crack at that? Well, I, one of the personal attorneys would be better to answer that because I mean, well, I think you're, you're giving it up uh, in terms of the idea. I, I think that once you put it out there, there's no real understanding between you and the person who views it randomly that you'll be compensated. So I think as far as your idea has expressed in the sizzle reel, you're giving that part up. I mean, I think the big question for you is what's it getting you to put it there? Um, I mean, if, uh, and, and also what is a sizzle reel like? I mean, if it's something that's um, more to show visual style or something like that, I mean, it, it may not be, it may not really be something that is very easy to steal. If it's something that really shows a narrative or something that you, you're going to um, create, it, it may be characters or something, it may be different. But I think the question on that is really, and all of this, by the way, there's some risk you're going to assume. There is. You're going to be in this business, you're going to assume some risk, you, you should assume some risk, you are never going to get anywhere writing something and holding it like this and never giving it out. So I think it's just, you know, um, you just have to be aware, look, there's a risk. If something's out there, somebody could do something with it. It will be difficult to pursue. By the way, these are all difficult to pursue, these claims. I mean, you may disagree, but I, I think for the most part, you know, the advice I give clients, you don't want to be in a lawsuit. You just don't want to be in a lawsuit, and, um, and, and they're, they make life difficult. So, um, so it's all a little bit of a balance for you. There's another question, but just one final thought. Remember, we're only talking about idea protection here. If your scissor reel uh, includes a bunch of stories, some dialogue, that doesn't mean someone can steal your story and your dialogue. Right. But the underlying idea could be taken. If, if the underlying idea is boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl back, you, you're in trouble, right? Because that's not really going to be protectable. You're not, but if there's a really unique idea in that sizzle reel, you are going to lose the ability to protect it by just throwing it out to the world. That doesn't mean you lose the ability to protect what is copyrightable. Unless it's a reality show. <laughs> in which case, you can't, really can't protect anything. Yeah, right? yes. At least here in the United States. Um, question. Um, I know attorneys aren't really like used for as agents and stuff like that, but I've been hearing this in the business that can an attorney actually help you get an idea to somebody? You know what I mean? Like a hookup, a connection, or a partnership, or some kind of 
relationship they have? You, why don't you, we start with the talent lawyer? You can, but I don't. Is the is the simple answer? I mean, and most and most tend not to. But yeah, I mean, I think attorneys. Um, I mean, maybe not any attorney. I mean, not like you know, there's a guy in Minnesota and he happens to have a law degree. But if it were somebody at a talent firm that represents you know a host of writers and 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 talent. Um, I think similar to an agency, you, sometimes you make an introduction or sometimes you send somebody a script and, and they'll usually take it on the same basis as they'll take it from an, um, from an agent. As a general matter, it's not something that, that we do. It's not kind of the business that we want to be in because it kind of puts attorneys a little bit in the line of fire and it's not really our job. So some will do it, but I wouldn't go looking for, for an attorney. I'd look for an agent. It's what they do and it's what they do well. Actually, the WGA isn't keen on that either. What's, oh. I mean, a it's agents gonna... are, are licensed to get work. Lawyers are not. Yeah. And I mean, mo uh, many agents have law degrees and so forth, but they, you want somebody who's, a, who's representing you as an agent. Um, my I, I think the question probably is if you don't have an agent and you don't have access to an agent, can you use a lawyer? The answer to that is yes. If the studio or the network or the production company has heard of the lawyer, they might very well accept it and that is a way to do it. I, many lawyers won't submit, um, but if, they, if you find a lawyer who's willing to and the network or the studio is willing to accept it, yes, that is a viable way to do it if you don't have otherwise access to an agent. But if a lawyer tells you I'll submit it if you pay me, be very careful. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. And the Guild has rules about members working with agents who aren't agents um, if you're not an authorized agent through the Guild. But um, I think it's a further question. Yeah, and that's actually, you know, in the letter that you will get when you try to solicit, uh, when you try to submit something that we haven't solicited, it says, we will only accept submissions through uh, agents recognized by the WGA. Uh, we can't recommend one, obviously, uh, but you can obtain a list. And I There's think you guys one. make the list available. Yes, it's, I think it's on the website. I'm almost certain it is. It is. Mm -hmm. Was there one more question over here? There's one over there. Over here. Okay, so right under that light. Right here. Well, just start. Oh. We can't see you, but if All you right. start talking into the mic, we'll hear, we'll hear you. you. Okay. Uh, going back to the uh, the uh, sizzle reel question, uh, does um, stuff that you put on the internet, such as your sketches on YouTube, uh, would that fall in the same category as giving your product away, basically? A anytime you put something on the internet that anybody can access at any time for any reason, you are running a significant risk that if somebody takes that and uses it or uses portions of it or whatever, uh, or ideas from it, yes, you're, you're running the risk. I ideas, we haven't really talked about this, are only protectable in very limited circumstances. And if you give it away that way, you're, you've lost the right I, I can go that far as to say definitively, you've lost the right to sue somebody for stealing your idea. As Steve said, if it rises to the level of copyright infringement, that may be different because the standards are a little different in terms of access and, right. and things. But, but so for idea, you're, you're out of luck if you put it on the internet. If you're an artist, because you mentioned sketches, it, it, it's too long of an answer to get into it in detail, but the short answer is sketches are copyrightable. So the question is going to be, what can people copy from your sketch without committing copyright infringement? And that's not that easy to do. So a sketch is something different. To take the idea out of a sketch and just steal the idea of the sketch without committing copyright infringement, that's a little harder to do than stealing the idea out of a script or et cetera. So you may have more protection there. That doesn't mean it's a good idea. Yeah, if we wanted to put that sketch in one of our shows, we would come to you and get a license. It would be a problem. But if your sketch was, a, you know, the, the head of a man with the body of a fish, and we said, well, we like that idea, we could do our own sketch, and we wouldn't owe you anything. High concept. I have a high concept reality show. Um, it is a, is it too loud? I'm sorry. No, no, no. 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 He I just doesn't want to, want to hear your idea. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that was my, my, sorry. my legal defense. That was funny, actually. That's the, uh, 
<laughs> this legal defense. <laughs> um, it's anyway, one of the three um, monkeys. hopefully they won't do that when I am presenting my pitch. But uh, the room. reality show actually is a limited liability corporation that's based in uh, Las wait, wait. Vegas, Nevada. Don't pitch us the idea. You have I'm not going to, okay. but I'm saying that it is a limited liability corporation, the actual entity of the show. You mean the owner as well of the as, as the as it's progressed, I have registered with the guild every single like revision, whatnot. Um, because it is a high concept, it's never been done before. I also have the things that are registered trademarks. Okay. So having said that, I mean, the type of show that it is, I need people. So I put it on the, it has a website. Right. So I'm wondering if I have uh, an okay. issue. There. So that's a good question. So we got to come at this from a, a different angle. If you need to involve other people who aren't buyers, idea submission claims are never going to happen against them. So the nature of your relationship has to be such that stealing your idea would violate their agreement with you. So you need to enter into some kind of contractual relationship with those people that says you're an employee or whatever you do is a work for hire for my entity. You mentioned it was an LLC. So protecting yourself against ideas being stolen from people who you don't have this buyer-seller relationship with relies on either a contractual relationship you have with them or a relationship that exists because they're in your employee, perhaps even if there isn't a contract. But you need to have them sign something that says, you're going to share confidential information with me, and it belongs to you, and I can't do anything with it, and anything I add to it belongs to you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. OK? A disclosure agreement, which there, yeah. there are forms available. I was just, I was just referencing the fact that it's stolen, the idea that it's stolen because it's out on the internet. Well, you, you, as to people who might want to make the same show you're making, in the United States, you, an idea for a reality show, this is not really much of an overgeneralization, this is basically it, isn't protectable. It may be protectable in other parts of the world, but in the United States, it's not protectable under copyright, and the scenario you're describing doesn't fit within this idea submission channel that we've been talking about up here. So, so yes, someone could decide they really love that idea for a show and they're going to do it themselves and never talk to you about it. Now, now let me explain something that, that most people don't realize. Ideas themselves are never really protected as ideas or you might think of a piece of property being protected. The only way that you protect an idea is when an idea is presented or pitched or submitted by one person to another in a certain context under certain conditions. It's the relationship of the two people, the person pitching and the person receiving, that's what's really being protected when you say that the idea is being protected. It's not really the idea itself. It's that the law is saying in certain circumstances when an idea is disclosed from one person to another in a, in a particular setting under particular circumstances, we're going to protect Really, what they're protecting is the relationship of the two parties that they've been creating by one person agreeing to pitch and the other person agreeing to, to receive the pitch or receive the submission. That's what's being protected. So when you put your idea on the internet, there's no one-on-one -on -one pitch or presentation. It doesn't fit the setting, the very limited setting in which an idea is going to be protected. You're, you're sort of in, in the parlance of the Supreme Court from many years ago. You're sort of blurting out your idea to the world. And it's not going to be protected. If somebody sees it on the internet, they can steal it all they want. If it's just the idea that's being stolen, you're not going to be able to protect it. So that's maybe a good segue to, we've got about seven minutes left. Maybe that's a good segue to, what happens if you do everything right, you write your idea down, you go in, it's in a context in which both parties implicitly understand that the submitter expects to be compensated if their idea is used, and then you believe that the idea has been used and you haven't been compensated. What do you do? What's that going to look like? How's that going to play out? Maybe that's what we'll spend our last six or seven minutes on. Um, Maybe, Glenn, you should start, because that's usually someone calling you up call <laughs> yeah. or, or walking in your office, so maybe you could cue us up. Well, I, okay, 
if you if you believe that you have an idea that was stolen, then you call a lawyer who typically represents the plaintiffs or the talent side uh, in in those sorts of disputes. And if the lawyer you contact is someone with integrity and experience, they'll they'll listen to your story and they'll look at it very carefully, and they'll know intuitively whether or not this is the kind of setting or the kind of scenario in which an idea may possibly be protected. Uh, and if so, if, if not, I mean, plenty of people call and, and, and talk to me over the phone. I, I get, I was t telling somebody, I probably get five people a week who come to me. Everybody thinks their idea was stolen. Everybody, okay? And every time a hit movie comes out, I can't tell you the number of people who have come to me wanting to sue on Avatar, for example. <laughs> Okay, I've had at least four or five people. Yes. And I have, for one reason or another, declined all of those cases, but they've gone on and they found other lawyers and they filed suits. And I, and, and I can tell you there's a lot more than five because our law firm represents the defendants in all of those suits and it's a lot more than five. Okay, so, so, <laughs> so you, you know, in, in the lawyer you contact will look at the situation and they'll decide, they'll, they'll make sort of an initial cut. Is this something that might possibly fit the scenario in which you'd have some rights that you might want to enforce? Uh, if, if, if it is, then um, you would look at the situation, the case more carefully. The client would send you whatever written materials they have. They'd probably give you some sort of chronology or summary of, of what happened or what you think happened. Um, if at that point that I think this, the case has some potential merit at least, I will typically recommend that you write a letter, you have your lawyer write a letter to either the studio or the network, whoever it is, to give them a chance to explain. Um, you know, suing people uh, randomly or without very, very good cause is not cool in, in my mind, okay? Um, and, and, but I, what I'm saying is not necessarily the prevailing thought out there. There are plenty of lawyers who do what I do who will throw anything against the wall and see if it sticks. I just don't happen to believe that, maybe because I had family you know, who worked in the entertainment industry when I was growing up and I know how hard everybody works and it's, it's very difficult business. So I believe in writing letters and giving people a chance to explain. Now. In the old days, you would write that letter, and typically you'd get a letter back saying, drop dead, if you pursue me, I'm gonna kill you, I'm gonna kill your kids, I'm gonna kill your wife, and everything else. <laughs> that but was we, before Jody took yeah, but, over. But, but, but softened it a little. But yeah, it's, things have evolved a, a, a lot, I think, in the last 10 or 15 years. Most of the time, it may take a little while, but you will get a response. Sometimes, especially if the lawyer you, who's representing you is someone who the other side knows and trusts a little bit, they will share information with you. And I will tell you, um, I have been persuaded, like in the Avatar situation, I, I mentioned uh, the Benet Brothers case, uh, The Last Samurai. I have, there have been a number of times over the years where based on this initial dialogue, I've been satisfied, at least to my belief, that pursuing a case is probably not wise. And I'll decline to do so. Um, so these days you can usually get a pretty good dialogue going and at least get some information before filing a suit. Um, but, uh, you know, there's always a lawyer out there who will file your suit if, if you want one. And, uh, and somebody uh, took the case that he declined mm -hmm. and they lost. I, I've, had, I've had a lot of people take cases that I've declined and I'm, I'm proud to say I can't remember any that I remember hearing later on turned out to be a success. So. But, the, but there are lawyers out there who will do it, yeah. and uh, so you, you just have to be smart about it. You've got to really be careful and open your eyes. Um, okay. There are a lot of ideas. So we only well, have a little Glenn's bit of time. Up here. We, yeah, let's Glenn's put Glenn's number, number yeah. up. Sorry, you're going to have to there? look it up on uh, the internet. Well, there's enough info um, there. <laughs> Go ahead. We only have about a minute left. But I a, it's a serious issue that the Guild, that writers in general are very is serious about. and. Um, while the Guild doesn't generally enforce individuals' copyrights, if when there are cases of, um, of stealing from pitches and so forth, it's something the Guild is interested in and we might take a case. It's, um, and generally for members, but possibly, well, it wouldn't necessarily be for members. It, for anybody, if it's a, um, the right case, we w could be involved in it. And um, so you can always contact the Guild and talk, have 
one of our representatives go through your case, say, similar to talking to a private attorney, but it, whether it's a case that the guild would, you know, like to pursue and enforce, um, because it, it, it's a serious issue that we are trying to, you know, get rid of the producers who are doing it. Seri uh, in, you know, um, repeatedly, repeat, repeat offenders. Thank you. Thank you. So we're just about out of time. I think some of the panelists, maybe not all of us, I'm about to choke, will um, be here afterwards. So come up and we'll answer your questions. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you.